Hi everybody, this is Crypto Rich, working with you to get rich with crypto, filling our pockets with crypto profits. I have with me Andreas Fink. Andreas makes a return to the channel after, I don't know, almost forever. He is the CEO and the founder of Kajutel. We're going to be finding out what's happening with Kajutel. Now, before I introduce him, I want to let you know that this is not investment advice. Do your own due diligence and do not invest any more than you can afford to lose. All I'm doing in this video is sharing with you what I'm discovering as I travel along on the blockchain. Now, I, did, I have featured Kajutel during their ICO, which was in, the, in late 2017, and I shall link to my videos on Kajutel at the end of this video and in the description below so you can get updated should you wish to do so. All right, hey, good afternoon, Andreas. Hello. Thank you, thank you so much for making yourself available. It has been a long, long, long wait, a long wait. Now, before, before we go into the Kajutel project, do you want to say a little bit about yourself and your background and what you do, and then tell us about Kajutel? Yeah, about me, I mean, I'm a telecommunications engineer. I've developed software for telecommunications network. I have built up internet providers. I have built up data centers, um, including GSM networks in Iceland and rural area Wi-Fi networks. So I'm in this business since a long time. And um, <clears throat> with Casutel, we've started a project to actually bring high-speed internet uh, to West Africa because they are in high demand there. So the situation we had here in Switzerland in 1994 when I started my internet provider here, that's basically what they have there now. And the speeds are horrible, the prices are expensive, availability is bad, quality is bad. And uh, we want to change this uh, by bringing uh, good infrastructure there. Right. And, uh, we have chosen the ICO pass to raise the money for this because uh, we believe that way everybody can profit of it instead of just a few big guys um, which are the, the known rip of companies of the telecommunications industry. Yes, 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 yes. And then uh, token holders, Kajitel token holders of which I am one, will be receiving, you know, once the project is all up and running and receiving making revenue they'll be receiving a share of the profits and before that just a couple of things that i remember about guinea Bissau. let me share the screen with you to let people know exactly where it is right so this is a duck duck go go is my browser is my search engine not google um guinea Bissau is in western africa uh, just south of gambia and senegal and north of guinea sierra leone liberia this is the gold coast of Africa, there's Burkina Faso, there's Nigeria. And what I remember about Guinea-Bissau is that it's uh, pretty stable. It's been pretty stable for the last 10, 12 years, economically and politically. Uh -huh. It's got a young population, it's growing. Uh, there's a lot of use of the mobile phone because with mobile phones, you have a lower cost of entry than say with a desktop or a laptop. Um, yeah, so they have, uh, I mean, the, the, the population is like 1.7 million there, and uh, I think about 1.4 million in the latest statistics we have seen uh, have a mobile phone. So basically everyone has a mobile phone. Yes. Um, and the, the mobile phone companies, uh, they're making a fortune there because uh, everybody is calling everyone. Um, but on the internet side, they have horrible speeds. I mean, they have 100 kilobits. Uh, if you're lucky in the city, you might have one megabit uh, at some point in time, like at three o'clock in the morning. Um, but um, most users, uh, they have very low speed. And with very low speed, you cannot watch YouTube. You cannot, you know, it takes a long time to uh, send emails uh, or browse the web. Right. And, um, it has improved a little bit the last few years, um, but there's still uh, a, a large lack of infrastructure. And yes. Yes. The basic reason is that they don't have access, uh, they don't have the backbone capacity because they're not connected to a C fiber. So they only use microwave links to Senegal uh, and to Guinea uh, to actually uh, get their bandwidth or over satellite. And that's all limited bandwidth. Right, right. And then what you're going to be doing, what Kajitel are going to be doing, is building a network of transmitters, 4G transmitters across... Yeah, what we're, we're working on doing, 
which is, is, is first of all, we have to bring the capacity into the country. So we have to pull fiber from the neighboring country, from the landing stations of the cables uh, in the sea, which is in, in Banjul and in Conakry. Mm -hmm. If you zoom a little bit out, you will see them. Okay. The, they're um, in neighboring countries? Uh, Banjul is not exactly neighboring. Yeah, Banjul is in Gambia, so we have to cross a little bit in Senegal uh, to get to Bissau. Right. And Conakry is in the south in Guinea. Right, 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 right. Okay. So the so the cables come there, and then you, what you're going to have to bring uh, towers from Conakry or by cable to Guinea-Bissau. Well, there there is a little bit of state fiber in Guinea, which we can use. Right. Uh, in Banjul, uh, we have to cross the piece of Senegal over microwaves, uh, but it's possible. And then from the border uh, of uh, Guinea-Bissau into the center, we have to lay our own fiber. Right. So that's uh, cost of that's that's going to cost quite a bit of money to do this, a couple of million dollars. But there's no alternative. I mean, if you put microwaves up, you can get to a gigabit maybe, uh, <clears throat> and you can mount this quick. But if you want to get to 10 gigabits, the microwaves are very limited. So you only get like two kilometers or so. So you have to build a lot of microwaves. And if you want to have 20 gigabits, then uh, you have to double everything, and then it gets very very expensive. And um, so uh, what we are going to do is we are going from the border into the center and uh, we're going to start with microwaves because that's the quickest one to start. But we immediately plan for the fiber to lay it down because we're going to need this capacity very soon. Right. Um, and then when we have the fiber in the country, then uh, we have the capacity while the others don't. And that's why we, how we can offer cost-effective high-speed internet uh, because we're sitting on the capacity. And okay. then, you know, from, from Conakry or, or, uh, or uh, Banjul, we just bring it back to Europe over the sea fiber. Okay. To our existing backbone. Okay. And then, where, I, d d I remember the towers, Andreas. Where do the towers come in? Well... So you know, the fiber is just to get the capacity into the country. And then, of course, you have to build towers to actually feed the customers. Right. And uh, we're plumbing hundreds of towers um, to actually connect uh, the customer to the network. So we have two parts. We have the backbone, which is like, okay, bring the capacity into the country. Mm -hmm. and then we have the access network where the people are connecting to us. And there's different technologies. I mean, some customers might be served directly with the fiber, like a bank or a government agency or something, you know, big customers. We can serve them directly by fiber and end users, we can serve them uh, by a 4G infrastructure. Right. So they can use the USB dongle in their laptop, they can use a tablet uh, or a phone with two SIM cards uh, to use us uh, for the internet while keeping their existing phone on the other network. Right, okay. Okay, now I, I want to take a slight detour to uh, this guy. So David, David Vine, yes. who, the CTO, and I think it's useful to mention him and his background because you've got the background with setting up the projects that you've done before in Switzerland and in Iceland. And on the website, I'll have the links um, to the website and everything in the description below and people can see those companies. But do you want to say something about David Vine and his expertise? Well, David is a, a British fellow. He lives in uh, West Africa since over 25 years. Um, he has been building up TV networks. And uh, he has uh, built a, a TV network in Guinea-Bissau in the past um, uh, to redistribute TV channels. That's actually also a very interesting business case. Uh, which has been very successful in Senegal, for example, uh, which actually brought me uh, in the first place to Senegal in 2003 mm -hmm. uh, to meet the company who was doing this. Um, so you can uh, redistribute TV channels and then you can uh, pay TV channels, like similar to what Sky is doing in, in, uh, in Europe or other satellite-based companies, uh, Canal Plus uh, and, and companies like this. They are gathering TV content and they redistribute it to the end users and they charge some end users for uh, premium channels and make their uh, benefits like this. And some channels are free to air for everyone. 
And um, so he was involved in, in the technical buildup of such a network in Guinea-Bissau. And so he built all the towers there uh, for this network and he was uh, getting the license for it and building everything up. Uh, it was not his company, but he was in charge of all the technical aspects. So uh, that's how we got together because I, 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 I was talking to the competitor in Senegal uh, at the time and uh, we, we met on some forum somehow and start to understand the market there. Yes. And so he, he dragged me into Bissau. I was actually looking into Bissau in 2003 as well when they gave out the first GSM license. But uh, I didn't jump in at that time because it, the conditions were not very uh, favorable and it was like all the setup at that time. Um, but from back then, uh, I earned a lot. Of, I, I gained a lot of inside knowledge on how the country works, uh, what the situation is, and so on. Right, right. And he has a lot of expertise and knowledge in the area, and lots of contacts. And is yes. the Agitel man on the ground? Okay. Now you mentioned competition. So what are the competitors to Kajitel? Because they must be big mobile phone company okay. providers. Well, in if we're talking about Bissau, uh, well, there's Orange there. Mm -hmm. uh, Orange uh, is everywhere in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and there's MTN. And uh, they are focusing mainly on telephony. Uh, so internet is not, is, 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 I would say, their weak point. And uh, we're, we're not attacking them on the telephony base because we think uh, uh, we leave them the business for the telephony. That's a whole business by itself. It has its all its, uh, its complexity with all the international calling, with all the fraud cases and all the possibility of abuse. We don't want to do this. We want to do pure internet and focus on that. Right. Uh, so, and, uh, you know, if we bring a lot of capacity into the country, we might even be able to sell them some capacity at some point, which uh, is a commercial aspect we have to look at if that comes to the point. Um, but our focus is just to provide super well internet. Okay. We okay. use the same technology. We use 4G technology uh, and Wi-Fi, of course. Uh, well, it's not the same technology because they don't have 4G. They have 2G and now they have 3G uh, in the last two years. When we started, they didn't even have 3G. And um, yeah, so that's uh, the differentiator. So we're focusing on the internet and they are focusing on, on telephony. So we're not exactly do competitors, but of course they also offer internet services on the mobiles. Okay. Very good, very good. And then this is not, you know, you're not a cryptocurrency project that's building some, some software application. Mm -hmm. You're building something that requires concrete and digging the ground and electricity. So infrastructure project. And one of the things about infrastructure projects is that they, they take time to build. Yes. It's going to take time to build this network. Yeah. But before we even get to that, you have had some challenges Yes. <laughs> so do you want to talk about those? Yeah. Well, okay. The, so the, the, the project started actually in 2014. So we created the company in 2014. We said, okay, we want to build this network. Uh, we applied for a license. We got the draft of the license, what we're getting. And then uh, they said, well, that's what it's going to cost. And then we said, okay we're not going to pay the cost until we have an investor who comes along with it because otherwise it would be wasted money. Uh, so we were looking around for investors and uh, it was very difficult to find anybody who wants to invest in West Africa because a lot of investors, they have no clue what's happening in those countries. And then they refer to 10, 15 year old data. And then, you know, they think they still have a civil war. They think they think, there's Ebola there, or there's think all kinds of nonsense mm. not up to date uh, because there's not a lot of public data available unless you go there on the ground. Uh, so uh, those investors uh, we have been talking to, they have just had um, outdated data, which uh, or we just met the wrong ones, let's say this way. So um, then we decided that we are. Um, giving it a try on the cryptocurrency market just to 
sell uh, the token as a share to the company. So like if you go on an IPO on a stock market, which is to use the IPO instead uh, as a vehicle to, to trade our shares and have people uh, profit out of this. Now the difference is instead of having a couple of very big investors with, with large pockets, uh, we need a lot of small investors or we are getting a lot of small investors who spend a little bit of money on this. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a little bit a different approach and has different effects. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of nonsense as well. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, people who think that they are buying a token for a dollar and expecting it tomorrow to be a thousand dollars worth and, and things like that. It's just not realistic um, in any investment case. Um, and uh, so, Sorry, Andreas, that's, that's forgive how me. we get into this. Yeah, forgive me for interrupting you, but I yeah. think that's a, that's a point worth elaborating on. One of the things that cryptocurrencies have done, it's allowed, it's democratized investment in a way that people can get in on the ground floor on very promising projects. But it's also brought in people who don't have much of an understanding or experience of investing or what it takes to build a business. You know, they may not know when they put in their one ETH worth to buy some cash tokens or their $100, that it actually took Amazon nine years before Amazon turned a profit. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the problems. So, you know, if we're looking at the cryptocurrency market, our project doesn't look that sexy like others because others say, oh, you can invest $100 and we're going to make you very, very uh, rich. Lambo like tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, like BitConnect and so on. And then at some point it's going to fall apart and no, everybody loses his money. Yes. While in our case, we are more like a traditional investment because people invest into infrastructure and infrastructure is, is there to last. I mean, once we build this network, this is not going away. This is going to be there for 10, 20, 30 years. Yes. And uh, there's a reason for that. But the other side of the coin is because it's a long-term investment, it's also a very profitable investment in the long run because, you know, let's say we build this network now and, and uh, we get the first customers, uh, the first customers are going to pay us money. <clears throat> and with this money, we pay off the infrastructure. At some point in time, somewhere around three, four years, we have paid back our original investment of all building all the towers. So we have like a free network, uh, which is just owned by us, which doesn't cost us anything because what does it cost to run it? It costs employees cost. Um, it might cost a little bit of lease of land or so, mm. and that's it. Because we don't have any energy costs, we don't have any internet costs inside the country, because that's all our own infrastructure. So we are not depending on anyone. But on the other hand, we have to invest more in the beginning because so we all own our infrastructure. If you would do something like this in Europe, uh, you know, let's say you want to become a mobile operator in Europe. The easiest thing is you sign an MBNO contract, you create your SIM cards, you do your marketing, you're a mobile operator. This is actually piggying back on somebody else's existing network by mm -hmm. leasing capacity on it, by leasing uh, infrastructure. So uh, the guy who originally built that network is profiting off all those new guys. And in our case, there is nobody to piggyback on. There is just nobody. So we're going to be the first one, which means if somebody else then comes and says he wants to do uh, some additional services, then he can come to us or he has to come to us because nobody else has the infrastructure. Right. Or if somebody wants to compete, he has the same cost of entry, which means he would have to build the same infrastructure as we did and he has the same cost. But while he starts to get into the market, we are already a few years down the road, which means we already have paid off most of the investment, uh, which means we can compete heavily on price, which they will not be because they still have the high costs in the first one. So um, that's why it's interesting to, to build something from scratch in such countries, because you are becoming kind of a monopoly. I mean, right. you're not really a monopoly because everybody can do the same but it's going to be costly from them, while for us it has already amortized. Very good, very good, okay. Well, let's get back to the challenges then. So 
the challenges yeah. before building? What yeah, the you... challenges were, okay, uh, so we had all this uh, prepared in the beginning. Uh, we had the contacts with the government to do the licensing thing and everything. And uh, we were just thinking, well, this is now a uh, formality. We had all this work done in the past. So we just re renew our request and then they can uh, sign it to us and everything's fine. Um, the problem is that people have changed. Uh, the CEO of the regulatory was um, replaced at that time. And uh, some people were put into positions which don't really belong there. And uh, I mean, I can tell you that there was an investigation by the, I think it was the World Bank or the IMF. Mm -hmm. uh, and they discovered that there are some millions of dollars disappearing on bank accounts of the government. <laughs> and it was in the Department of Energy and in the Department of Telecommunications. It's just like, oh, there's $7 million missing. Nobody knows where it went. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, so uh, that, those kinds of things were happening there. And uh, I mean, it has nothing to do with us directly, but it, it just shows you uh, the type of people we were dealing with. Um, so those people were, of course, saying, ah, oh, there's a new player coming to the party. Um, uh, he wants to have a, a GSM license, so everybody else paid $7 million for GSM licenses, so we should pay that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story is really, we didn't ask for a GSM license, we asked for a license as an internet provider. And in their law, they have two different categories. They have internet providers, ISPs, and they have mobile operators. Now, if you look at Europe, there's no difference. You know, if in Europe, it's like, it doesn't matter if you are mobile or not mobile, what matters is the spectrum. You use frequencies, which is the reserved good, which the government is administrating, and that's what you're paying for. Uh, if you're doing TV over it or internet or whatever, that's a second secondary thing. Um, and the internet providers, like in Europe, you have to just to register that they know who, who is on the market. So uh, if they have statistics requests or so, they know who to address to. Um, and there's like costs of like $500 or so. And in the Western Africa, they have put up laws, and that applies to many of those countries down there, that they are still thinking in the old metaphors, like, okay, we have a GSM operator. Those are like, Vodafone's, Oranges, uh, Hutchinson's, you know, the big guys with lots of money and deep pockets. And then you have internet providers, which is the guy next door running an internet cafe. You know, that's the way of thinking they have. That the mobile operator is also an internet provider and the internet cafe guy is also providing voice over IP telephony. And, you know, this is all becoming mixed in one. That's something which hasn't hit the law there. Right. And that was one of the biggest uh, problems we were having because we were facing some technicians who were saying, oh, you are a mobile operator. And we were saying, no, we are an internet provider. We just use the same technology as mobile operator, but we're not intending to offer you know, standard telephony phone calls. We're just trying to offer internet over the same technology. And this was like the ping pong game. And then, uh, you know, the, the boss there got fired, which we originally talked to. And uh, the previous one uh, was getting in charge. So we were hoping like, okay, now things get back to normal. And then you go there to a meeting, um, you know, you fly 5,000 miles to meet those guys again. And you face a technician who says, yeah, but you have never said what you're going to do. We have never seen any documents of you. It's like you have sent them like 20 times the same documents and you're facing a guy in a meeting saying, I've never seen your documents. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that by, there's just like one bad guy there who just tries to delay everything as much as possible. And uh, it's probably safe to assume that he's being paid by a competitor or so to do right. so. Or he's trying to get some money for himself, which he's never going to get from us. But he's trying to block everything. And that was like uh, the thing which was 
uh, delaying everything and pissing us off because every time we go there, it's like, yeah, you just have to do this one small little thing. And like the last thing is like, we got a letter saying we are officially now treated as an ISP. Mm -hmm. So we said, yes, we want to have this license now, which means like, they could have given us that uh, license for it uh, right away, but they haven't. So we have to apply for it. And then uh, they said, yeah, but we need a technical plan. Okay. So we worked out a more detailed technical plan. We have sent them a technical plan yeah, before, but they just ignore it or whatever. So we send them a very detailed plan of like, okay, here's where we're going to expect to put our sites on and so on. <coughs> and now the technicians come back and says, yeah, but for the license, we need to know the exact frequencies you're going to use, uh, you know, which uh, angle of the antennas they're going to point to. I mean, this is things you are putting up when you are actually installing the things, mm. when you're doing the planning. And this is usually like a year later after you have a license. It's like, uh, I don't even know which frequencies we, we are allowed to use. So how can I plan anything if I don't know which frequencies we are going to get? Mm. So like a chicken and egg situation. So um, we made it very clear to them that this is not going like this. And um, we are now in the final stage that either they give us the first uh, allocation of, of our license and then we can give them all the other details down the road when we're building it, uh, or we're gonna drag them to court because you know, uh, it's now one and a half years since we're talking to them uh, where we renewed everything from A to Z that they're just playing with us. And that's very unfortunate, but that's the situation there. But I still have hopes. I mean, um, the, the boss of the regulatory is um, thinking positive about our project, I have the feeling, uh, but the, those decisions are taken in a consortium. So there's a legal guy who has to give the okay. There's a, um, a technical guy who has to give the okay. Um, and it seems to be that only the technical guy is blocking us right now. <coughs> but anyhow, there's additional developments. Uh -huh. um, before, sorry, Andres, before you go on to, let me just recap, right? So in a nutshell, the the rules or the of the game have just people have just been saying no 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 you need to do A B C you go and do A B C and then they say no wait a minute you got to do it we said do A B D no wait a minute you didn't and we've done this right and then there've been changes of personnel and possibly people hankering for you know give us give us a little yeah, kickback yeah. or something right and maybe yeah, it's, it's being paid by it's, competitors and stuff it's all a it lacks clarity there isn't any um, enforcement of any regulations going on and auditing to keep it all clean and clear so the process has prolonged and prolonged and prolonged and you're now saying give us we've done everything you've asked give us the license or we're going to go to court yes because the law is very clear i mean the ministry even has uh, written the license uh, and now the consortium actually has to sign it and give it to us <laughs> and the and there's just one guy say, yeah, but wait a minute, I have still this question and that question. Those questions have nothing to do with technology. Like one of the questions was, uh, give us the, uh, the Gantt plan, like the, the project planning, or uh, give us the budget. It's like, that's none of his business as a technician. It's like, yes. if I'm spending $1 or $100 million, uh, it's like, what the fuck? It doesn't matter <laughs> for him. Yes. And, uh, you know. So it's obviously that this is just a, an attempt to delay it. Delay it. And uh, we're not going to continue with this because uh, it becomes ridiculous. Yeah, it's already ridiculous in several months, but um, we just have to uh, enforce this because the law is very clear. So they cannot say no. Very good. Um, very good. Okay. And, and how long will that court process take, do you reckon, roughly? I don't know. I mean, we still have hope that um, we don't need it. Um, I mean, we're putting political pressures within this as well. Uh, we're talking to the Minister of Telecommunications, which is above the air. And I mean, uh, uh, you know, we might talk to the press and other things. It's 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 like 
we want to move forward and build our thing. And uh, if the country doesn't want this, then uh, they should say so. But what they're doing is they're just trying to delay it for whatever reasons, and those might be very personal reasons of one person. And uh, because, I mean, we're, we're not taking anything away from anybody. We're not asking for resources from the government. We're not asking the government to give us money for anything. We're not uh, asking, uh, you know, anything which is out of the normal. Mm. And uh, such processes, I mean, I had GSM licenses in Iceland in 2007. I know the process and, you know, this might take a few months normally. And, um, and sometimes there's reason to reject it in, in certain countries or, you know, if they don't have any spectrum available, they cannot give it to you, of course, or they make an auction or they make a beauty contest where you apply uh, and so on. And uh, that's all a formal process. And um, you might win in some cases, and you might lose in some cases. Uh, and you can live with that. But they don't have the formal process because their law is written in a way which is outdated by the technology by far. And uh, that makes it part of complex, so they don't know what to ask for or even what to do, so they just come up with something. Right, Anyhow, okay. Anyhow there have been developments. So yes. we some exciting um, Now to the good stuff. Yes. Uh, I mean, our project plan has always said uh, that we're actually also going to Guinea. And... Um, um, Guinea is 10 times bigger. Yeah. So we were actually going to Guinea, create a subsidiary there, and talk to the government there of what's needed to get a license there and uh, what we can do in this country. Mm -hmm. Now, in Guinea, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, we have a, a couple of more players in the game today. Uh, the internet connectivity in Conakry is not that bad because they're sitting on the landing station of Fiverr, of course, mm -hmm. which is part of it. And uh, the state has also started to build some fiber inside the country. So actually the, the, the road you're just pointing to, if you go mm -hmm. up left, uh, yeah, this one, uh, along this road they have built fiber, the whole, the whole ring. Right, okay. So this is an existing fiber owned by the state, which you can actually lease. And you can see that it is getting very close to the border of Guinea-Bissau. So we can actually plug in there uh, to get to uh, the capital of, of Guinea, of, of Guinea-Bissau, um, instead of pulling our own fiber down to Conakry. Of course, we have to pay them something, and it's not clear how much they're going to charge. Um, but that makes the pass to connect southbound much more practical than the one northbound. Because right. The northbound, we have to cross two countries. There's more administrative hurdles in there, while going south to Conakry is relatively straightforward. <clears throat> now, there is one thing which stops us right there right now is that the government of Conakry of, of Guinea has, um, or the regulatory body has told us that they're changing the law this year. Mm -hmm which means that they're making it much easier for internet providers to come to the country. So they're changing the rules for everybody. And that actually means that all the GSM operators, their license are going to expire this year and everything has to be renewed. And they're just in the process of setting up those new rules, uh, uh, making it clear to everybody. And once this is done, then uh, they can process our license uh, request. Um, but we're pretty confident that this is uh, going to work very well. We also have uh, met uh, a potential partner country, a partner company in Guinea who already has a lot of infrastructure which we could buy up and integrate or partner with. Um, they're mainly on business customers and fiber. Uh, so that's uh, uh, an extension uh, which is planned and uh, I think this is going to go much smoother than Guinea-Bissau. Right. And then Bef we went further uh, down. Okay, before we go to another country, yeah. right, just a little bit about Guinea-Bissau. Because <clears throat> when, I, when I covered you during the ICO, sorry, a little bit about Guinea, I did 
do a bit of research into Guinea-Bissau. I know next to nothing about Guinea. And I don't, I don't know much about Guinea-Bissau either. I know even less about Guinea. Guinea is a larger country, larger population, uh, larger economy. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, about, it's about 10 times as big. Right. In terms of people, in terms of economy. Um, uh, they're better off because they sit on the fiber. Uh, they have, uh, they're sitting a lot of, on a lot of gold and a lot of mining, which is kind of in all those countries around that area. I mean, Guinea also has a, Guinea-Bissau also has a lot of mining products. Um, uh, but in, in Guinea, um, there's, you know, they have gold, they have diamonds. Um, I think they have bauxite also and a, a few other minerals which are in Nimon. So, uh, it's uh, quite an interesting country. It's um, they're quite busy, and um, it's it's growing well. Uh, okay. I have and a president there who is 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 developing the country quite okay. And, okay. Um, and I see it uh, in 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 a better state than Guinea Bissau. Right. And in terms of internet penetration. In terms of internet penetration, because they have the sea fiber, they have you can have high speed internet in Conakry. Right. In, in, in your the gonna, your aim is to spread it throughout the rest of the country. Right. I mean, uh, of course, uh, we're not going to skip the, the the capital. Yes. And if I say high speed, I mean in the hotel I had like one or two megabit there, and it was still kind of sometimes unreliable. Uh, but it was usable. You can send emails, you even can watch a YouTube video if you have to, um, which in Guinea-Bissau is like impossible. So they're, they're further down the road in, in, in terms of uh, current uh, availability. It's a bigger country, but there's still a lot to be done on the countryside. Right. And uh, I mean, the, the fiber they have laid owned by the state the fiber is there, but you actually cannot buy it or rent it yet because they haven't figured out what price they're going to charge. <laughs> so that's the state. And, uh, but that's going to change very soon. I think they're also going to change the management of that company. But okay. we met the guys who also operate the landing station and uh, that's uh, very well maintained. So the landing station company is like owned by all the internet providers. Uh, and uh, because everybody has to use it and uh, so that's quite fairly shared and everybody gets the same price and so on great okay thank you and then the other country or yes other so country. now we're going outside of the original plan um, we're going to Sierra Leone okay because along the way where we have been discussing uh, we met some guys with very good contacts in, in Sierra Leone and uh, we realized that in Sierra Leone you can uh, get a lot of, I mean they have similar problems like everybody in this area and uh, there's lots of potential there. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, uh, we are about to get the license there and uh, we applied for the license like, uh, well, three months ago. And the whole process is going through. Sorry about that. We had a problem with our internet connection between Andreas in Switzerland and me in the UK with our hundreds and billions and trillions of mega megabytes. <laughs> we just had a breakdown <laughs> with internet. Perhaps you need to do some more towers between the UK and Switzerland, Andreas. Now, you were talking about Sierra Leone. So yes. Let me, let me go back to sharing the screen. And you were saying that it's looking like you're going to be getting... The, the application is going through very smoothly in Sierra Leone. Yes. Okay, so what else about Sierra Leone population, economy, internet penetration? Um, Sierra Leone is, uh, I can't remember the population, I think it's like 8 million if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a little bit smaller than Guinea. Um, they have a uh, uh, Probably a similar situation like in Conakry that in, in terms of economy. Uh, it's a fast developing country and um, it has similar problems in terms of infrastructure. Uh, so in Freetown, you get internet access uh, pretty okay. 
Uh, but if you go outside, you're lacking the infrastructure. And of course, if we're talking about high speed internet, it's very, very, very expensive uh, for the people there. So um, there's still some room in this in, in the main city there as well. Right. Um, so um, we made a plan to build the infrastructure in, in, in Sierra Leone from A to Z, similarly, you know, same technology as in Guinea-Bissau and Guinea, mm -hmm. and to build the fibers and so on. And we presented it to the government and they were very, very keen on this because they were expecting us to say, yeah, they're going to ask for money from the government to build the whole thing and so on. Uh, and then we said, no, we're just asking the permission to be allowed to do it. And uh, they immediately understood that this is uh, something which brings the country forward. And uh, so everybody is, is, is very keen on having us there. So we got the draft license already. Great. With all the details in it, a uh, couple of very small mistakes, copy and paste errors and so on. And uh, we are supposed to get the final versions today or maybe tomorrow or the day after, but very, very, very soon. <laughs> okay. And, uh, so that was actually uh, quite a different experience compared to Guinea-Bissau because we started there like three months ago. So that's uh, a big difference. And um, it costs a little bit more, but uh, it's still worth doing. Yes. And um, so we have a, a new team member in, in for, for Freetown as well, uh, for Sierra Leone, who comes from there, but who lives in France, which actually has been talking to me about Sierra Leone like three, four years back. Uh, he wanted to have like an MDNO kind of setup and uh, was looking for investors then and I said mm, this is going to be difficult if you're depending on existing operators which can play games with you in those countries this is a risk <clears throat> so uh, we basically united our projects there and um, said okay we're going to do this so we have a subsidiary in Freetown uh, belonging to the Guinea-Bissau uh, uh, main company mm -hmm. Uh, we have flight tour license and it's supposed to be delivered in a couple of days. And then uh, we have to start building there. So while in Bissau they're still thinking of if they want to have some good infrastructure, uh, we will be starting building infrastructure south and then Guinea in the middle will happen soon as well when uh, they have changed the laws there so we can do the whole things. I mean, okay. they could have given us a license for like three months, but what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're changing the laws. <laughs> I got so, it. So. Now, with, with, with Sierra Leone. Yes. So let's say, I mean, just rough ideas and another whole thing. With any project, you, you're going to have delays. And with an infrastructure project, even more so because, you know, you might not have difficulty, get, there might be a delay with getting materials from a third party supplier or something, right? Mm -hmm. All sorts of issues like that. Um, but how, when will you start building? How long, what's your time scale for okay. the building? Uh, we're talking about time is like, okay, from the point we have the license and from the point we have enough cash to actually do this, uh, I expect that it's going to take us like six months to do all the planning. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to put the antennas? Because you have to do simulations on, on, on what kind of coverage you're getting at those locations. And we are planning to put a hell of a lot of antennas. Uh, because instead of putting one big cell, we put many, many, many small cells. Because you have to do this if you want to you know, be able to transport the capacity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're only doing telephony, it doesn't matter that much because you have a lot of capacity on, on one cell. But if you're doing internet, then uh, you want to be able to deliver 100 megabits to a customer. Uh, technically, then you need to have a lot of bandwidth uh, between those locations. And this means you have to make the size of the cells smaller. So you don't have that many customers on one cell. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have to duplicate this cell uh, further down the road and reuse those frequencies. So that's why we need a lot of cells. And that means building up a lot of infrastructure. And that means we have to do a very proper planning because the cells sure. 
you know, maybe every two kilometers we're going to have a cell, or even every 500 meters. So um, that has to be carefully planned. And if we're looking at Freetown, there's lots of mountains there. You know, Freetown is sitting on like a, on the edge of a mountain. This half island, the rest of the country is more or less flat, but in Freetown we have mountains. So uh, you have to carefully plan this and simulate it, which is taking quite a bit of work. So we expect that this is taking about six months um, to do this. And then we need to get the suppliers, supply the equipment. That's where we start to need the hard cash um, uh, for that project. And then we can start building it. I mean, we estimated that we can build like two towers uh, per month. Uh, but if we want to build faster, then we have to create more teams to build parallel in parallel. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a question of logistics, finding the right people and so on. So the more cash you have available, the faster you can build. But uh, yeah, we're probably going to need three, 400 towers uh, in a country like Sierra Leone to, 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 to really start. And okay. Okay, and that's a bit of a different thing. I mean, the last guys who got a license there, they have three. And uh, they're basically up in the mountains of, of, of Freetown. And uh, they just cover the whole city with three towers. But if they get really uh, a lot of customers, then uh, they're going to run out of capacity. And um, yeah, so that's how we do it a little bit different because we plan ahead for lots of capacity because we know it's going to come. Yeah. I mean, we've seen this in Europe 20 years ago. Nobody was thinking that you could have a gigabit over wireless. Now you yeah. do. I mean, this is um, what happens in 20 years and uh, that's what will, will happen there in the next 20 years. And so you want to be ready for it. Yeah. I feel like making it future proof. Now, do you have enough uh, cash? Do you have enough money to roll out in Sierra Leone? Uh, no, we probably have to raise uh, more coins if to include Sierra Leone, or we just don't build Guinea uh, for the moment, and and so on. So we're gonna have to sell more coins, uh, or I mean, we still have coins from the ICO which we haven't sold, mm -hmm. and uh, so we will have to sell some of them uh, to actually get the cash in to build this. And, uh, but we're going to do this at the time we actually need it. So we're not gonna go to the market and say, hey, we wanna sell a billion coins uh, and then the price is going to drop to the seller. We want to, you know, sell it off um, as late as possible. Right, so like once you have the license, really everything's all set up to go and right. then you just need the money to build. Okay. And then what, what, what a, a secondary ICO, an IEO, a STO? Uh... Well, that's, that's something uh, we haven't even figured out yet. I mean, currently we're thinking that the, the, the tokens we currently have, which were meant for Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, um, we're going to use the, the, those uh, to actually finance Sierra Leone as far as it's possible. And then we see if we have to raise the capital further up. Mm -hmm. It depends also a little bit on 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 on, uh, on the coin price. If the coin price goes to hundred dollars, then our remaining coins are um, ten times, you know, or five times more valuable. Then we don't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it drops down, then we need uh, to sell more coins. So that's why we're saying we want to sell it as as, as uh, late as possible uh, to optimize um, the impact. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Thank you, Andre. A anything else you want to let us know? Yeah, well, we're being traded uh, on uh, various markets now and uh, the trading is, is happening quite well. <laughs> uh, the, the value is increasing every day. Uh, it's fluctuating a lot, but that's like with any coin on this market, um, except maybe the really, really huge ones like Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, we had some bad experience there as well with one market, which was running away with a thousand coins. And, um, but, um, uh, that's the market we're living in. Yes. Uh, always <laughs> a risk. Now, if, if somebody wants to buy Kajutel tokens, can they approach the company directly 
to buy them or uh, they're going to get they can, I mean, if somebody has a million do a million dollars or so and wants to buy a lot of tokens <laughs> well, okay, so if you have a million dollars and you want to buy tokens yeah. i mean we had such requests coming in uh but they all turned out to be shady guys um with not really uh Never mind. Okay, okay. Um, they weren't genuine requests. Genuine. They interest. weren't genuine, right? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if somebody has a genuine investment re request like this, then we can sell them direct. Uh, but the easiest way is just to go to through the markets like IDEX Token Store and Mercom Talks, uh, where you can just trade it uh, safely and uh, properly. Yeah. Is it also on Fork Delta? Do you know? On Fork Delta. I don't Fork, know. This Fork Delta is a decentralized ERC20 exchange. It's oh, I don't know. It's next to uh, we, we are on Ether Delta, Delta but. Uh... No, then it should be on Fork Delta because Ether Delta, do not use Ether Delta anymore. If anybody is watching this, do not use Ether Delta. It is, I don't even know if it works anymore. But Fork Delta has an API that connects to Ether Delta and uh, is pretty solid and reliable. Okay. And th there's no there's no listing fee as far as I know on Fork Delta. You just put in the smart contract and there you go. Okay. And, and I'll have a link to the Telegram group in the description below if people have any questions or anything. Is there any last thing you want to let us know before we finish up? Uh, no, that's about it. Invest in Casual is going to be a bright future. <laughs> yes. We're just on that mic. It might be useful because this is a this is a token that's that's going to be backed by real physical infrastructure, which would be the the towers, and then also by the service that it provides to people in Guinea Bissau, eventually Guinea, and before that Sierra Leone, and then like I said at the beginning, people who own the tokens will be getting a share of the revenue, and I get like all the costs are front loaded, yes. and all the profits are back loaded, because once it's all set up, it's just like a money tree. Uh, I mean, look at the Vodafones and Oranges and all those big telecom companies. Yeah. There are many printing machines. Yes. Uh, how, how can they buy uh, 5G licenses for billions of euros, like what's happening in Germany right now? I mean, yes. somebody has to pay that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Andres, thank you so much for making yourself available. Do come back onto the channel again. And uh, look forward to speaking to you. And this is a project that I will continue to follow. If you have any questions or comments, put them in, in the description below. And between now and when I see you next, please keep filling your pockets with crypto profits. This is Crypto Rich and Crypto Andrea signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.